Mystery Slam podcast from ActiveMystery.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham, coming at you nearly live from St. Mary's, Ontario. A full baseball episode for you today. It's uh, The baseball playoffs just started last week. They're in full swing now. And we are in the bastion of Canadian baseball. We are in the Blue Jays Expo's room here at the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. I'm sitting with Scott Crawford, Director of Operations for the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. Welcome to the podcast. Well, great. I'm glad to have, have me on here. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate you doing this. And this is a really cool room, too. We're here. We're, we're sitting next to a wood BJ Birdie. There's an Expo's on deck circle, some Hall of Fame plaques, a bunch of sign stuff. I'm sitting next to a base from Exhibition Stadium. This is a really cool room. So I'm, I'm really excited about uh the podcast. Yeah, we thought it was one of the best rooms to start with. I mean, yeah. right next to your shoulder is Paul Mulder's World Series MVP yeah. trophy, so you can't get any better than that. No, you're a great really player and, and uh, remembering the Jays winning the World Series. Yeah. <laughs> remember that? Remember when that used to be a possibility? <laughs> yeah, I thing? remember. It won't, it won't be long again, though. That's I right. get, uh, <laughs> I got assurance from the from the Blue Jay front office and uh, and my my faith in them that it, it won't be long. All right, all right, <laughs> you say so, um, based on this year at least. But hey, the players they're good players. They just didn't play well. That's right. That's so, right. Yeah. Injuries and uh, consistent starting staff. That's what they yes, need. Yes. Yes. So we're here in St. Mary's, and and so the Baseball Hall of Fame started uh, Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame started in 1982. I saw at the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto, and moved out to St. Mary's in the 90s. So so why did it move out to St. Mary's? What, like, what, what is it about St. Mary's that, that just says Canadian baseball? Well, there's a couple of things with St. Mary's. I mean, one, it's, uh, it's a small town. They wanted to head into a small town. It was in Toronto, like you say, for, for about a decade. It, it didn't work. It was too small of a uh, fish, I'll say, in a big pond. Mm. Um, with Toronto, so many things to do. And, and so they wanted to go into uh, St. Mary's. And hit to a small town. There's about 12 cities that bid for the Baseball Hall of Fame to have it come to their hometown. And it came down to us in the city of Guelph. Okay. And, uh, which, which made sense because baseball, if you look at the history of baseball, started sort of between Guelph, London, Woodstock, and we're just north of London. So right. St. Mary's was a, was a great choice. And, the, and there's two main reasons for St. Mary's. One is the, uh, the history of the game. The first ever recorded game in baseball took place in Beachville, Ontario on June 4th, 1838. Mm-hmm. And there's a felon there named Adam Ford. Well, Adam Ford happens to be the mayor of St. Mary's and a resident here in St. Mary's and a doctor here in St. Mary's during his uh, lifetime. So that brought the historical tie to the little town of St. Mary's. And also the land. The St. Mary's Cement Company donated 32 acres of land to us that allowed us to build three ball fields and house the museum and our walking trails and all kinds of things right. on our on our site. So we have the historical tie with Adam Ford, and we get the land with uh, the cement plant donating it to right. us. And it's a really cool setting there. With the you can see the plant right by, beyond the fields as you drive up, and it, it's in the two fields. And you so you're in the process of building the third. We have a third little one in the process of actually building a fourth. Fourth. Here now. Oh, that's the fourth. Yeah, that, yep. that's the sign set. Oh, yep. Okay. But the the town of St. Mary's is right. is uh, financially back in the field, and and we're building it because we're the we're the baseball experts yes. so that uh that works well and and yeah the cement plant it used to be an abandoned gravel pit so right. we turned it into a beautiful park-like setting mm-hmm. with three soon to be four ball fields yeah. and say walking trails and, and picnic areas yeah. and so and are they used mostly like all summer like yeah they this, get a lot of use? Uh, we had about 450 events here this past summer with, oh, wow. with uh you know a lot of kids games of course because we had kids first here and then uh tournaments and clinics and Pepsi Skills Contest and Blue Jay mm-hmm. Clinics, and we run a Kids on Deck Summer Baseball Camp. And uh, so it's quite busy, right, from mid-April till uh, mid-October. So what I'm wondering, too, is then, you know, you have all these clinics. Obviously, baseball today and, and maintaining uh, the culture of baseball and youth clinics, she's talking about the kids and stuff. That's obviously a mandate of, of what you do, but also mm-hmm. it is a Hall of Fame, so it is a history institution as well so how do you view the museum or the hall of fame and what is its purpose well we see there's two purposes here one is and you mentioned sort of both of them uh the first one is preserving the the vast history of the game of baseball not only in canada but in north america and worldwide and canadians have played all over the world um so we really try to preserve the vast history of the game of baseball but secondarily we try to promote the game with today's youth i mean we want more kids playing ball. Baseball in this area has taken off in the last 10 years, and we're proud of that. I think we have a lot to do with our facility and our site and our ball fields that are, are, are some of the greatest around. But uh, we want to promote the game with baseball. We use our kids on deck summer camp to really push the game, promote the game, mm-hmm. and uh, to get kids off the couch and running around in the outfield <laughs> and getting the fresh air and and, uh, and playing some ball. 
Is it a tough sell with kids, though? Because if you go to a game, and uh, this year I think I've been at six professional parks, three major league, three minor league. I think every time I've been, there's been kids around. And by the third or fourth inning, you can tell that they're starting to get a little mm-hmm. restless, and the parents are taking them back a little bit more. and just continue to feed them candy, which I guess is a good idea at the time until 10 minutes after they finish the candy and then they're even more hopped up and want to do anything. Like, So is, it, is baseball a tougher sell to kids? I, th- I think it is a little bit. I mean, it's a slower paced game than you into hockey or football yeah. or soccer, but it's, it's the old tradition, the father-son game, the right. family game where you take the kids out and yeah, I mean, they, you know, if the game's not exciting, there's not tons of hits every innings. If it's a pitcher's yeah. duel, I understand the kids can get a little bit bored and whatnot, but uh, the Blue Jays and other organizations are really trying to promote the game to kids, having fun things, having, mm-hmm. of course, their mascot ace is around, and just yeah. having games in, in the stadium and toys mm-hmm. and whatnot. If you go down to Comerica Park, they have a Ferris wheel yeah. and, uh, for the Tigers games, you know, yeah. things like because they know families are they're trying to attract families to events, and it's a long three-hour baseball game, and, and if it happens to be a little bit of a slow game, well, then you can take the kids up, do something for an inning or two, and then come mm-hmm. back down and watch the last couple innings, and yeah. hopefully watch your team win. Yeah, yeah I, was out at, I was at Safeco this year, that's one of the parks we went to, and, and it was the first time I was ever at Safeco, and they the same thing, there's a playground out in mm-hmm. left field that the kids can go and just run around, and I think part of it might be to, I mean, if you're a six-year-old kid, and your parents take you to a baseball game, you can go run out there for 20 minutes at like 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and then you might sleep through the rest of the game too. Is is a distinct possibility? Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's just so. I mean, just the more kids and more families. I mean, the kids are the future. And if you can yeah. get them out to a game and watching a game, whether it's a couple innings, I take my kids. They you know for again for half the game they're interested, and then they want to go do something for a couple innings, right. and then they come back for the last couple innings. Right. And, and I get it. It's just you want to build that for the future. I mean, sixty mm-hmm. five year old people going to the game now are great, but twenty years from now they're not buying the tickets. Right. It's the five and ten year old kids yeah. now. Then in 20 years, they're buying tickets and maybe right. bringing their kids. So there's one you want to start them as young as you can. Yeah. Get them involved. Get them watching the game. Get them following the players. Mm-hmm. And then when they become adults, you know they're going to be, still be buying tickets and yeah. bringing their family yeah. down. And plus, the rules are can be somewhat complicated at times, especially some of the more esoteric type rules, <laughs> like where you see two guys on one base or if teams bat out of order. Like those things you don't see very often. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. when they happen, it's nice to have a sense. Like I umpired growing up, so you have a sort of a sense of what those rules are, and, and it's easier to pick that up when you're a kid. It is, and it's all about teaching them and learning them. I mean, yeah. when I brought my kids there. You know, they had all kinds of questions, of course, yeah. and you know, you answer them and you try to explain to them, and then you got you get the rare circumstances that mm. you know rarely ever happen. But uh, you know, again, it's just a part of it's the old tradition, the family family day at the ballpark, yeah. the father son, the the mother daughter type thing yeah. at the ballpark where yeah. you just get there and you have a hot dog and you yeah. you watch them and, and the kids say, "Dad, mom, what, what's what's he doing?" You know, and you yeah. can just sit and explain it to them for thirty seconds, and then they're. Then they say okay, and they're off to eating their hot dog. Again, yeah. So. yeah, and I always root. I think kids would like it when like uh, a manager comes out. I think Jim Leland is really great for this, where they get really fired up and start screaming. I mean, I think that would be fun for kids too. It's very so. Well, at least someone like Jim Leland does it in a very cartoonish manner, where he gets so overwhelmed. And uh, there be uh, some interesting managers. Lou Pinella, another one yeah. who likes to you know pick. He, He's famous for picking up a base and throwing yeah. it fifty feet in the air yeah. and and whatnot. And and yeah, I mean it's. Whether it's good or bad for the sport, it's like a hockey fight. You know, yeah. everyone that's the loudest yeah. cheer you get is a hockey fight, yeah. but then you get the other half of the crowd says ban ho- ban fighting from hockey. Yeah. Well, let's say with baseball, I mean, the loudest cheer is when the umpires are are throwing dirt or kicking dirt, yeah. but the other half of the crowd's like, oh, that that, sh- that shouldn't happen. Right. That shouldn't be allowed in the yeah. game. So it's you get both sides of it, and and that's what makes sport professional sports yeah. and, and baseball interesting. Mm-hmm. And we won't get as much of it anymore now that they've apparently the technology exists where we can go back and look at things that just happened to see if we got it right. Apparently that's a new development, that this <laughs> instantaneous ability to look at a replay exists. Yeah, they, they, and they're bringing that in more and more. Yeah, so, yeah. There you I go. Mean, the technology, technology is just mind-blowing. It is. It really yeah. is. So, um, so there's, there's an article that um, a lot of undergraduate students have to read uh, if they do a four-year degree in Canadian history from a book called The Beaver Bites Back, which was published in the early 90s. And the article is called Whose National Pastime? Baseball and Canadian Popular Culture. And the argument of the uh, article is basically that late 19th, early 20th centuries, that baseball was the number one sport in Canada. And it was above lacrosse, it was above hockey, or even basketball. 
as basketball was still in its formative stages because you know baseball was one of the sports where there was this probably I guess the first major professional leagues uh, no Canadian teams but major professional league uh, and and sort of people really bought into it and there's still the American influence and loyalist uh, traditions and all that but I'm just wondering how you feel about that concept and, and that argument that baseball has been a major uh, cultural institution in Canada and even at times rivaled if not surpassed hockey I definitely agree way back in the day you know late 1800s early 1900s baseball was uh, you know probably number one in Canada I mean they didn't have the NHL baseball's been around since since the mid 1838 in Beachville mm. And but uh, you know London and Guelph had the best teams in the world in the late 1870s and early 1880s, mm-hmm. and so and that's where I said earlier how baseball sort of you know started the hub between Guelph and London with Woodstock in between sort of the beginnings of baseball in Canada, and uh, I think they were top you know back then. Now of course you got so many options too. I mean yeah. back then you didn't have all the options they'd have have today or in the last 50 years. I mean you got so many sports now. I mean definitely hockey is ahead of baseball in popularity and mm-hmm. kids playing, and there's no doubt about that. Um, but we are Canada. You know, everyone thinks we play it year-round, but, uh, you know, we do squeeze baseball in a couple months a year, yeah. <laughs> and then hockey gets the rest, yeah. of, rest of the year. But um, I think at one time baseball definitely was was the number one, but uh, definitely now I would say hockey and and uh, is probably overpassed it. But, mm-hmm. you know, we baseball's not trying to beat hockey in Canada. I mean, hockey's... Hockey's Canada, right? It yeah. equals Canada. We all know that. Um, we're just trying to be the best we can, um, keep promoting the game to the kids. And, and uh, Tom, you know, you shouldn't play any sport year-round, I feel. And uh, right. so you need a good variety. And baseball helps hockey, and hockey can help baseball. Mm-hmm. So, But so in that older time, like, because baseball is a sport that really has evolved. I don't want to say more than the other sports because I don't know. Um, but it, it's a sport where, like, I've read, I read a lot of books about, you know, that 19th century game, early 20th century game, the dead ball era and stuff. So, so baseball is a sport that has really transformed over the years. So how recognizable would a baseball game from those years when it might have been the most popular sport in Canada, like if I'm watching it from today's 2013 perspective, how recognizable would the sport be? It's definitely changed. I mean, back then you didn't have the home runs. You had, I mean, you didn't have the outfield fences. The fans were on the field watching, yeah. you know, and, and uh, if a hometown player hit the ball, they'd, you know, they would make it difficult for the outfielder yeah. to get it. You know, <laughs> yeah. if the opponent hit the ball, they'd make it easy for the outfielder to pick mm-hmm. it up and throw the guy out at second, um, just the way it was. And there weren't home runs, and the ball, you know, right now they use a new ball every seven or eight pitches, and, yeah. and back then it was every game they had one ball, you know, mm-hmm. until it got lost or, or totally destroyed. Um, so there is drastically difference in the in the sport, but again, I think it's like all other sports, they, they do change over the time. and. Yeah. And uh, society thinks it changes for the better, or the people running the sport mm. thinks it changes for the better, and and uh, we just move on from there. And I, I think the other thing that maybe people don't realize or really know all that much is that the tradition of minor league baseball in Canada is so significant, because the Expos start in 69, yeah. Blue Jays 78, but minor league baseball has been in Canada Yeah, it's been forever. around, you know, you know, 100 years. We used yeah. to have AAA teams in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, mm-hmm. Ottawa, um, single A team in St. Catharines. The yeah. only pro team, affiliated pro team right now is out in Vancouver. Yeah. It's the Blue Jay single A team. But uh, minor league sports, but around Toronto and Montreal are the two key for minor league professional yeah. baseball in Canada. They were around both since the late 1800s. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they just, you know, they both lasted into the 60s when, again, when the Expos came into town and, and whatnot. But minor league and AAA ball. And, and we do still have pro leagues in, in Edmonton and Calgary and mm-hmm. in Quebec. There's one. But they're not affiliated with Major League Baseball anymore. Right. But there was a vast, long history of, of minor league ball. And if you go back and look at the Toronto and Montreal teams, just the Hall of Fame players that played on those teams are just yeah. outstanding. Well, I mean, I guess the most notable is that Jackie Robinson uh, played in Montreal with the Royals. He did. He played the one year, 1946, yeah. he, you know, before he broke the color barrier for Major yeah. League Baseball. And, and that was uh, very unique to have him play that one season. And mm-hmm. one player a lot of people forget about is Roberto Clemente played for Montreal oh, for right. one year yeah. in 1954, I believe, before yeah. the Pirates got him. And uh, again, when you take the talents of those two, let, just those two yeah. alone, I mean, you got two of the greatest players in the history of baseball, and they both basically started their careers up here in Canada. Yeah, and there's a, a poster out in the lobby there of Babe Ruth in Toronto. Um, yeah, he hit his first professional home run. He wasn't playing for Toronto, but he yeah. played against Toronto in 1914. He hit his first 
professional home run right in, uh, it was Hanlon's Point, where the Toronto Island Airport is now. There's okay. a good ballpark there, and he hit his first professional home run right into the, right into the lake. So <laughs> quite, a, quite a smash. No one knew who he was going to become. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so it wasn't a huge story at the time, mm-hmm. but obviously he became the great Babe Ruth, and yeah. it became a huge story. Yeah. Now, we're sitting here in this Expo's Blue Jays room, which is pretty cool, and there's a museum dedicated to the inductees and then uh, other baseball in Canada and... and um, it's a relatively small museum, um, at least compared to what you have in Cooperstown. Mm-hmm. But as a museum, I mean, where do you get these sort of artifacts? Because, you know, something like Paul Molitor's World Series MVP, one, I'm surprised he doesn't want it. Mm-hmm. Um, and two, wouldn't that be something that Cooperstown would be interested in? in uh, so, you know, where does your stuff come from? Is there a competition or is there, with you in the Baseball Hall of Fame or the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame, you know, how was that acquisition process? Well, I mean, place? when we moved from Toronto to St. Mary's, of course, we got a ton of stuff because um, they had their Hall of Fame set up there, and they mm-hmm. had their pictures and their baseballs and jerseys and yeah. all that. And so we got all that stuff. Nowadays, I usually look after the getting of uh, or obtaining of artifacts. Um, whenever the new inductees come in, we always ask them for some items. Mm-hmm. You know, George Bell gave us some baseballs and some uh, a jersey this year. Um, in the past, other players have given us jerseys and bats and gloves and yeah. balls and cleats. And the, the current day players, I mean, there was just uh, four guys called up for the September call-ups uh, this past weekend, and uh, I've contacted all their teams asking them to donate something from their first big league game. Okay. Um, you see, one of our rooms all dedicated to the current Canadians who play. There's right. 22 that play in the big leagues this year, and uh, we always try to collect something from their first big league game or when they do something significant in the game of baseball, mm-hmm. like play in their thousands game, which Justin Morneau did last year. Or get their thousand base hit, which Jason Bay did two years ago. So we always try to collect artifacts like that. Competition wise, if it's a big thing, yeah. I mean, when Eric Gagne set the consecutive mm-hmm. saves record, Cooperstown wants some stuff, Eric Gagne wants some stuff, the yeah. Dodgers want some stuff, and we yeah. want some stuff. <laughs> right. Well, when you take that order, yeah. you know, I see us sort of fourth in line because obviously, you know, Eric's going to want to keep something. Sure. Cooperstown, it's a major league record. They want something, and they're the big Hall of Fame that's been around forever and of course the Dodgers want some stuff in their mm-hmm. thing so we were fourth we did get a we got one of his gloves that he used during the streak mm-hmm. not the glove he wore when, the, when he set the record but we still got an gl- autographed glove from him that he wore during the streak so mm-hmm. it was it was quite unique and, and yeah there's a bit of competition I always you know it's like when we collect any artifacts I say for the families that want to donate stuff or the players I said you got to be done with it you know we don't want to take something that you right. really still want yeah. or you want to pass down to your kids well, obviously, family comes first. Yeah. Um, we just tell people we don't want you to throw it out. If right. you don't want it and your kids don't want it, don't throw it out. You mm-hmm. know, bring it to us. We want to use it. We're going to build a uh, ten thousand square foot museum in the next year or two, and which is ten times as big as this one. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we have all kinds of we'll have all kinds of space and room for for artifacts. And and uh, we're getting more known again. Like everything, we're growing. The major league teams are starting to recognize us more. You know, because the Justin Morneaus and the Russell Martins right. and Ryan Dempsters. And uh, Joey Votto's, we've been bugging them now forever for right. more stuff. So those teams are starting to know us, and and uh, it's getting easier to obtain those artifacts. Yeah. But again, we are fighting. We're not fighting. We're competing with a few other mm-hmm. places, which is totally understandable. Right. But the sort of the end game of everyone is the same, right, is to preserve the stuff. Yeah, and that's what we want to do. That's like our inductees on our, our plaques and our walls and why we want to build a bigger museum is because mm-hmm. we want to preserve the artifacts, the history of the game in, mm-hmm. in Canada and around the world and and uh, we think we're doing a pretty good job now, but the uh, you know, we want to keep collecting and build a much bigger building for people to en- enjoy and preserve the history of the game. Right. And I think on the website it said, what, about 33% of your collection? Yeah, we have about a third time? on display. Yeah. As you can see, we're in the, f- in the one of the four smaller rooms, upstairs and downstairs, and this room is all storage and archives. Mm-hmm. We rotate the stuff sort of usually in the wintertime, and we always get new inductee stuff every yeah. year. The room that changes the most would be the the current Canadians sure. again when someone comes up the four guys I'm tracking down now um, hopefully they'll donate something in this spring or fall and again mm-hmm. we'll put it in the display and move some stuff around and, right. and we always try to keep you know the 22 guys are in the big leagues now we don't have everything something from everyone but we're pretty darn close and we try to highlight that because again these Canadians in the big leagues are, are making our story greater and better every yeah. day what about archival collections? What sort of stuff would you have there? Is it like old score books or scorecards or like contracts or we have a few old contracts. Yeah. Um, basically, it's a lot of papers, yeah. um, old records. We got the Simmons collection, which is a collection from the International League um, when Harry Simmons ran it in the Montreal for several years, and uh, it's a great collection of history. All the way, you know, it's got a hundred years of history into it, and okay. we got the Expo's photo collection, 
was donated to us. Okay. And uh, and all kinds of paperwork with pictures and, and whatnot. So, you know, our research library, part of the new building is going to be a research area, mm. and uh, which is fantastic because yeah. we have so many requests and, and so many people looking for information, whether it's a photo or whether it's a written letter from someone from 75 years ago that right. we know we have, but we don't have room to display it. Mm-hmm. In, he, in our current facility right. that's really that's a really good idea too and I, I, the expos now that they're gone and there's some distance from their surgeon interest in them as well I mean I know Jonah Carey's writing a book that he's in the finishing stages I don't know if he's looked at anything that you had but uh, and then there's this group that goes to a Blue Jay game every year with all their expo stuff so it seems like there's interest there as well and, and having a larger facility and having these archival holdings would definitely help there's uh, anyone who wants to look into it. Definitely. I mean, when the Expos left town, we went there and we got, with our big trucks and yeah. and we got everything we could, as you can see in the room we're sitting in. Yeah. You know, we have all their bronze plaques. We have all, all their 3D jerseys and hats and spikes and bases and pictures. And mm-hmm. um, and then we just got donated from the another museum, the uh, say the Expo Photo Collection. Mm. Um, so we have it. We try to preserve the Expos. I mean, they're still talked about every day. Like, they still exist. I mean, it's been 10 years now, which is yeah. hard to believe. But, uh, you know, the Expos were the first Major League Baseball team in Canada. They had all kinds of fantastic players play for them. You know, yeah. several in our Hall of Fame and some some aren't yet. But uh, yeah. they're ones that we want to remember. Charles Bronfman, the original owner of the Expos, is an inductee here. And mm-hmm. he's really happy that we're preserving the Expos. Yeah. And uh, we keep doing it because, again, they were, the, they were the first Major League team in Canada. And they mm-hmm. sort of started the whole thing. Yeah, and I, th- I think the Nationals have done an okay job. Based on what I've seen, I think they brought back a few old expos this year for a day. Mm-hmm. And I think Andre Dawson and Tim Raines are on their level of ex or whatever the equivalent of their level yeah. of excellence is with the expos logo. Yeah. So they haven't completely forgotten. Like they don't treat them as an they don't treat themselves as an expansion franchise mm-hmm. in two thousand four, which is nice. Yeah. Um, I mean they know they moved from Montreal to Washington. Yeah. I mean they're they're obviously have had a lot of success the last couple of years, mm-hmm. um, with their players and yeah. with their draft picks with Strasbourg and Harper and and a few others, but um, I mean, yeah, they're they're not a new franchise. They're the they're the Montreal Expos yeah. still. I mean, if you go to their records page, it's all you know, full of the Tim Wallachs and Tim Raineses and Andre mm. Dawsons, and you know, it will be forever yeah. until you know Bryce Harper plays twelve years in the big leagues. You know, and who knows where he'll be in that time? You know, mm-hmm. he might not be in Washington, but uh, um, you know, the records for Washington are all Montreal Expo yeah. records, and and uh, it's good that they're remembering. Mm-hmm. I think they've combined them too with the old senators' records and the nationals. Like they sort of sort of yeah. combine these different franchises. Because Washington's third try at Major League Baseball, yes. so they've yes. had uh, they've had a few. Uh, yeah, and that's what people in Montreal say. Well, Washington's on their third try. Why yeah. can't we get a, yeah. a second try? And yeah. and they're pushing. I, I think it's going to be tough for Montreal, but mm-hmm. never say never. I mean, the main thing I think they need is a stadium. Yeah, and uh, until they get a stadium, I don't think. The chances are too great. No, but maybe they got someone who's thinking about the stadium. I'm not totally involved in it, but we know about it. And yeah. uh, but I think number one would be getting a stadium, mm-hmm. a nice downtown open air stadium, which is what they wanted when yeah. they left in 2004. Um, they wanted to try to get a nice open air stadium, and we actually got the replica model of that stadium they were wanting to build. Oh, yeah. And uh, so it's quite a nice looking open air stadium, probably 35,000 seats, and and a lot of walking room and standing mm-hmm. room around to watch the ballpark, yeah. watch the ball game. So. Hopefully that will happen one day. Yeah, hopefully. And, and I mean, although, I mean, the fact that Jeffrey Laurie is now gone, I mean, at least he's out of the picture. We, don't, we won't have to worry about him again. And my idea would be that Bell buys the Rays and moves them to Montreal. And then you have a natural rivalry between Toronto and Montreal, because they'd both be in the ALD still. So you get that rivalry 19 times a year. And then you have the corporate rivalry of Bell owning the, whatever they call the Montreal team, and Rogers owning the Blue Jays. And so all the the Montreal games are on TSN, all the Blue Jay <laughs> games are on Rogers, and because those two companies hate each other, and I think that would just make for an unbelievable rivalry, and I'd be so excited. Yeah, well, for that. I would I would love to see it one day. I'd love yeah. you know Major League Baseball back in Montreal one day. I, but it's a, I think they got a challenge ahead of them, but yeah. they've got a strong group and a lot of yeah. people pushing. So yeah. hey, if they can do it, I'll be right I'll be right there cheering them on and yep. going to some games. Yeah, I have a standing deal with uh, a guy who I play softball with that he said he would buy tickets and take it. I think the whole team to <laughs> Montreal for the first game back. So. Perfect. Hold, you can hold them to that. Definitely. It's on. Now I put it on the podcast. So it's you got to hold them to it. So um, you talked about that the the exhibits do change over year to year, and you're closed for most of the, the winter. Uh, people can, if they have groups, they can still come in and make appointments. But you're not open daily as you are in the summer. So 
obviously part of that time would be changing over exhibits and, and how do you determine what you want to put on display and, and what sort of exhibits you want to have or, or if it's even just something that maybe you need to take back into storage just for preservation purposes yeah. like how, how do those decisions get made well this year was one of the things that was easy to highlight was Jackie Robinson and his because uh, the movie 42 yeah. came out and uh, so we tried to highlight that you know we were at the, we were at the premiere in Toronto right. um, so that was kind of cool with our Jackie Robinson artifacts and uh, so that was easy to highlight that this year because everyone's talking about the movie and and uh, and the great thing was Harrison Ford and all that all the good actors that were in mm. it and uh, and secondly I mean we obviously the Blue Jays we try to keep that updated because you know nine out of ten fans that come in here are Blue Jay fans yeah. and then the current Canadians like I mentioned before we always try to update the current Canadians because again we were talking about the kids earlier the kids don't know Fergie Jenkins they don't know Larry right. Walker. Um, who are the two of the greatest Canadians ever? But they know Justin Morneau, they know Joey Votto, they know John Axford, mm. you know, the Ryan Dempster, even. The guys that are playing today, they're not bench players. We've had an all-star every year since 1997. Mm. So we get some darn good players yeah. out there. And uh, Joey Votto's leading the pack right now. Yeah. Um, he's had three or four amazing years. He's on for another great year this year. Yeah. And uh, so that room, again, it, you know, we try to highlight that room, especially when kids walk in with their parents, because, again, they don't know, unfortunately, you know Fergie Jenkins and Larry Walker, like you and I do. Yeah. They know the current guys, and and uh, and the, we try to promote that. And mm-hmm. so we, that determines on on what that's not necessarily what we put on display, but what we show people when they come in. Um, on like I said, on display, we we try to just highlight the most popular things. Or if something happens over the winter time, right. we make sure we get that out on display mm-hmm. and, and promote that. Right. So that's sort of is, that's part of your larger marketing strategy. Um, obviously, the the Hall of Fame weekend is obviously your big time. I'm assuming that's when you get your most visitors uh, yeah, through yeah. the museum. But so marketing outside of that, and do you present yourself as come see the history of the game where all these great players, or is it more to help understand the current context and, and current players? Like, like, What's really drawing people in, do you think? I think it's a mix of both. Again, mm-hmm. when we get the... You know, we try to talk... I mean, people know we're a Hall of Fame museum, so right there that spells out history yeah. uh, without even saying anything. Um, so we get the historic people that want to see the old artifacts and the you know the hundred year old bat and the seventy five year old glove and yeah. and that type of thing. But again, um, a lot of people today's age, uh, you know, the thirties and forty year olds don't know the history, you know, the game of baseball. Mm-hmm. So if they're not interested in the history, again, it goes back to the current guys yeah. and who's in that. I mean, ten years ago we had almost nothing from the current players in this museum, and I thought that was a major downfall here. And uh, so I've really started to put the push on that the last several years. And and I think, you know, when we promote ourselves, we, we not only promote our whole site, it's, you know, 32-acre site, you know, mm-hmm. come play, you know, bring your team here, play a ball game, have a barbecue, come to the museum, right. check it out, learn some history, but also learn about the current players. Right. So it's it's definitely a mix of how we promote the place. And then when different groups call us, again, if it's a seniors group, we might promote something different than if it's, sure. uh, if it's a summer camp full of 12-year-old kids. Right. So. Right. And uh, I, I could see, like, if I had been a kid and I played growing up, like, if we had come here for a tournament or something and played on the fields mm-hmm. and they said, come in here. Like, personally, I probably would have been more interested in, like, that was late 90s, so I guess, mid-late 90s. So I would have been more interested to see if you had, like, a Larry Walker bat or something. Mm-hmm. So, like, I can mm-hmm. see it. I can sort of see that. And it's tough to get kids in here because, again, the kids think it's just old an old bat and an old ball sitting around and, right. and they don't necessarily care about it you know you get some kids that like history and whatnot yeah. but you know majority of kids like the interactive and the fast pace and in our new museum we will have more interactive stuff in, right. in here we have um basically nothing we have a tv to show a movie type thing right. that we play usually when uh, in the summertime mm-hmm. but in new museum we're gonna have more interactive stuff right. and that will attract the kids in and then once you get the kids in the door then you get you lock the door behind them <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh and then you can tell them, you know, a few things about the history of the game mm-hmm. and, you know, and Jackie Robinson and how important that was and right. in different aspects of the game. And, and you can get into, you know, Babe Ruth, his first home run. And right. if they know anything about baseball, they know the odd players like yeah. a Babe Ruth, like a Jackie Robinson. Yeah. And then you catch your attention with a few current, current things like, or a few old things like that. And then you get the current guys like the right. Vados and the Mornos and say, yeah, and they all know them and they can all, yeah. they can talk days about those guys. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Like that interactive stuff. Like I think at the Hockey Hall of Fame, I haven't been there in probably five or six years, but like they have the interactive games where you can shoot at a net or be the goalie and stuff. But the lineup for those things is right next to exhibits of stuff from like the 20s yeah. and 30s. That's and so that's a way to sort of 
while you're waiting to play the game, yeah. you read it. And that's where we're going to have interact stuff. It's yeah. similar. I mean, you can throw a ball, see how fast yeah. you can throw it. You can bat and cage, you can see if you can right. hit a yeah, yeah. 80 mile an hour pitch or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, there's these even things, these simulator catchers, so you can simulate catching oh, cool. a, a curveball or a fastball yeah. to see how it feels and how yeah. much it hurts. And, right. you know, um, <laughs> or see if you can <laughs> catch a knuckleball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Take one All right, Vicky's yeah. knuckleball floating into you. Um, but we want to have interactive stuff because kids. If you can get families here, I mean, mm-hmm. again, it's the old Blue Jays trying to get families in because yeah. if you can get the kids hooked, right. then it's going to only going to help down the line yeah. um, as opposed to getting, you know, a bunch of, of, not to sound mean, but a bunch of seniors in here. Right. Again, 20 years from now, they're not still going to be mm-hmm. coming here, unfortunately. Right. They're, right. you know, but the kids and the grandkids will. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Now, I mentioned, so you, it's a, obviously a Hall of Fame. So in a Hall of Fame, you have people who are inducted. Yeah. Or as yeah. Hall of Famers. Now, first, the, this 2013 class that you did in June was just a list of heavy hitters: uh, George Bell, Tim Raines, Rob Ducey, Tom Cheek, and Nat Bailey. And Nat Bailey um, owned the Vancouver Mounties in yep. the 50s yep. until they, I think until he died. Right? He still owned the team. Yeah, I think. And then um, they named the stadium after yeah. him. If you go to Vancouver, it's called Nat Bailey Stadium right. now. So, and he also of, owned White Spot or started founded White Spot. Yeah, he's restaurant. most famous for yeah. restaurants. So there you go. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, if you would say that there's a, like Rob Ducey, and probably any other year would be maybe a headliner of mm-hmm. a class. Mm-hmm. But he, out of those five, is probably four or five on people. When people say it, like, wow, because yep. George Bell, a great player, MVP, Tim Raines, uh, when you're better leadoff hitters, when he steals 100 bases mm-hmm. every mm-hmm. year. Uh, and then Tom Cheek, legendary broadcaster of, what, four, over 4,000 games consecutively yep. Yep. Uh, yep. before he missed a game. So I'll put you on the spot. Is that your best class ever? <laughs> That's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, it's probably one of our most popular classes ever. Again, because the names you mentioned, I yeah. mean, there was just and that, tons Rob of Ducey's a great like. That's what like Rob Ducey's a great player. Yeah, too. Like, yeah. yeah. Some people said, "Well, why is Rob Ducey getting in the Hall of Fame?" And, and they just look at his, you know, his average, or yeah. you know, but they didn't look at his uh, his career. I mean, mm-hmm. he played nineteen professional seasons, and he played over two thousand pro baseball games. Yeah. You know, between the minors and majors in Japan. I mean. Go down. There's only been 12 Canadians ever play uh, 19 years of pro baseball. You know, yeah. in 175 years of pro yeah. baseball, there's been 12 of them, and Rob's one of them. Mm-hmm. So, does that put him in the Hall of Fame? I, sh- I sure think so. He yeah. played. You know, he played for the Blue Jays. He played for the Expos. He's from Canada. Yeah. He played 19 years of pro ball. He uh, um, he played for Team Canada and he coached for Team Canada. Yeah. So, I mean, he's so people who question as soon as I say all those things are like, oh wow, I didn't yeah. know he did all that. And I said, well, you know, well that's yeah. that's why our committee really researches him. Um, you know, back in 2000, uh, 2003, we inducted Joe Carter. That was a mm-hmm. huge year. Two thousand nine was Larry Walker. Yeah, of course, one of the greatest ever. Um, but this past year, yeah, I mean, we got two huge names like George Bell and Tim Raines. Yeah. It was one of the most popular classes we've ever had. And then you throw in the legendary Tom Cheek. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, of course, passed away, but his wife and his kids were all here. So yeah. they told stories like crazy. People love to get their pictures with them and hear the stories about Tom Cheek. Yeah. And uh, and then Nat Bailey, of course. You know, there wasn't a lot about him because he's, he's from British Columbia. He's passed away. None of his family was able to attend. Mm. But still, he's if you go to Vancouver, it's like... You know, it's like Tom Cheek in Toronto. Right. Nat Bailey's a legend in Vancouver, right. and uh, and he was an easy person to induct. Mm-hmm. And well, I have a list of some of the other names here because there, are, I mean, there's people who you wouldn't maybe think of who would be in the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, Gary Carter, uh, legendary Expo and uh, Met player. Dave Steeb, best Blue Jay pitcher yep. ever. Yep. Yeah. Arguably. It's- I would say now, I mean, you got Roy Halliday, but he's yeah. still playing, and who knows how his career will end yeah. out, and uh, Jimmy Key, but I'd say Dave Steeps, number yeah. one. Uh, Cito Gaston, manager of the Blue Jays when they won the two World Series. Andre Dawson, big bopper for the Expos. Yeah. Ernie Witt, who not only played for the Blue Jays, uh, also managed the Pan Am Games team yep. uh, that won. Yeah, Ernie's a double inductee. He was yes. inducted as an individual back in 2009 with uh, Larry, uh-huh. and then we inducted the 2011 gold medal Pan Am game winning team baseball Canada team and he was the manager right. um, of that team it was the second time Canada's ever won a gold medal in international baseball competition mm-hmm. yes. and uh, we inducted the first team the 91 junior yes. team which had so Stubby Clap on it <clears throat> it did one of the best names ever Stubby Clap yeah. he's great and he's actually yeah. double inductee too because he? he was inducted as a player on the 91 team yeah. and then a coach for the 2011 <laughs> team so 
he's a double. Him and Ernie Witt and uh, Bernie Sillier and and John Har are all our, our double inductees. So <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah. And then you got uh, Pat Gillick, Paul Beast, and the architects of the Blue Jays. Those late '80s, early '90s teams. Bobby Maddock, who was in professional baseball from 1933 until 2004, which is uh, most people don't live that long. Yeah, I know. I know. Let alone. Bobby Maddock was a legend in all his Blue Jay days. I mean, he played with the Cubs back in the day, and mm-hmm. you know, was a player, and and then he just got the Blue Jays, and and he was uh, he did everything in the Blue Jays scouting, yeah. and and they call their their spring training complex, yeah. I believe, is called the Bobby yeah. Maddock complex now, and and uh, I'm, I met him a couple times, and and just a great individual, mm-hmm. and and uh, yeah, long yeah. long baseball yeah. career. Yeah, talk about baseball life, yep. man. Yep. Um, and then Fergie Jenkins, uh, pitcher for the Cubs. 18, 19 years, or however long. Yeah, he he's pitched. our. I mean, he's our greatest uh, pitcher ever by yeah. far. I mean, he won uh, two hundred eighty four games the nineteen seventy one Cy Young with the Cubs. Uh, he won. He, imagine this. He won twenty games six years in a row, right. and uh, for the for the Cubs. And uh, you know, imagine what you get these days, money yeah. wise. If oh, yeah. if a pitcher won twenty yeah. games six years in a row, yeah. they'd be you know they'd eclipse the two hundred million that a few of the players are getting yeah. these days. So. Yeah. And then uh, Lester Pearson is also in the. Yes, fans, yes, yes, yes. Uh, for his contributions, uh, he was a, die, a diehard baseball fan. Yeah. He played as a younger, a younger player or younger person, and then uh, just a supporter all, mm. all along. And he was inducted back in the Toronto days, and yeah. we're actually again sitting beside his Pearson Cup yes. um, in the Hall of Fame. And uh, that was an exhibition game the Jays mm. and Expos played for yeah. several years, um, named after him for all he did for for baseball. Going through this list, obviously a lot of great players. Do you ever find? Well, first before I ask this, like. How are people inducted? What is the process? I, I know the website said you have to get seventy for five percent of the vote, yeah. but who is voting? It's uh, we have a selection committee spread across Canada. Mm-hmm. There's uh, sixteen people on the committee, and uh, from from right from the east coast right through to the west coast. We think it's good to have representative from every con- or every province because we are the Canadian Baseball Hall yeah. of Fame. And it's ba- it's a simple process. If you think someone should be inducted here, you someone has to nominate them from outside the organization. Okay, and then they. Uh, they write, call me, email me, write me a letter, and then there's a nomination form. They fill out, they get it back to me, and uh, by December first of each year, okay. and then it's uh, and then I pass it on to the selection committee. And the committee we have uh, they have a first round vote, and then we get everyone together on the phone so they can talk about the pluses and negatives to everyone on the ballot. There's 40 or 50 people on the current ballot, mm-hmm. and uh, so they go through. Some guy from BC really thinks Nat Bailey should get in. They talk big about him yeah. and try to convince. You know the other from other provinces because the East Coast might not have heard of Nat Bailey ever, mm-hmm. and vice versa. You know we inducted uh, Billy Harris from New Brunswick a couple of years ago, and the guys on the West Coast were like, "Who's Billy Harris?" Yeah. And so, but that's part of having the process as a whole country mm-hmm. covered, as as you can fill them in and, and tell them details, and then so after the conference call, where everyone voices their opinion, and and then we have a final round vote. And, uh, and that's their final vote, the second round vote, and then that's who gets inducted. You need 75% of the vote, and and uh, if you don't get in, you stay on the ballot for up to nine years, mm-hmm. and then uh, and uh, you have to get at least uh, one vote every other year to stay on the ballot. So right. if you go two years in a row with no votes at all, mm-hmm. then, then you're off the ballot. And mm-hmm. it's just a way to keep our ballot relatively small because there's no rule about nominating anyone. You can nominate anyone you want okay. for our Hall of Fame, but if they go two years in a row with zero votes... Then they're off the ballot. Okay. So we figured two years was a good span. No one on our committee thinks they deserve a uh, a possible vote to get in our Hall of Fame after two years. Then mm. then they probably don't belong in the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame right. quite yet. Now know? you don't have to divulge who's on the committee if it's a secret committee. But what are like what is the background of these people? Are they historians? Are they uh, people who've worked in baseball? Former players? Maybe heads of provincial? Uh, yeah, baseball community. It's, it's like. a good mix of people. We have uh, basically all the ones you hit on. We have media yeah. representatives. We have uh, a couple of past inductees. We have uh, baseball historians and uh, and some Baseball Canada executives okay. um, that make up the 16-member panel. And uh, and it's a good group of guys. We try to change up one or two every year just to yeah. keep the, you know, like every committee and every organization, mm-hmm. you try to change up to get fresh faces and fresh blood in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, the committee works well, and it's, uh, it's a pretty good process. Usually the end of January, beginning of February, we announce the year's inductees, and, mm-hmm. and then the ceremony is the end of uh, June, when the last Saturday is in June every year. Hmm. Now, my mom wanted to know, too, why it took Tom Cheek so long to be inducted. And my thought was maybe you were waiting for Cooperstown. 
to do it too, and then you just do all of them in the one year. Yeah, we kept Shirley Cheek busy. I think yeah. she went to, I think she went to three Hall of Fame inductions. Ours was first, and then yeah. she went to Cooperstown, and then she had another one. I think in August for another town in the states that inducted oh, okay. Tom into one of his Hall of Fame. So Shirley had a very <laughs> busy yeah. summer. I think our committee. I mean, Tom Cheek won the uh, Lifetime Media Award back mm-hmm. in two thousand one. It's called the Jack Greeny Award, mm-hmm. um, similar to the Fort Frick Award in Cooperstown. Um, so Tom won that back in 2001, and we presented him that at the Rogers Center, and uh, that was a great day. And then our committee started thinking about whether, you know, because we have an award for media, just like Cooperstown has their Frick Award mm-hmm. and their Spink Award for sort of their media. Yeah. Our committee finally thought after a while, well, maybe some of the media deserve to be inducted into the Hall of Fame yeah. as well, even though we have a separate award for them. And so it's really been two media people. Alan Simpson, who started Baseball America, he's from Vancouver. Okay. And uh, a lot of people don't know that Canadian actually started no. the famous Baseball America magazine, but that was Alan Simpson and then Tom Cheek, um, now who's inducted as well. Um, but we also have to remember that we don't automatically put people on the list. People right. have to nominate the people. Right. So, you know, people say, well, why isn't this person inducted or that person? I often say, because they haven't been nominated yet. Right. And they say, well, why don't you nominate them? I say, well, you know that's not how we work. Like Cooperstown, mm-hmm. there's committees that put people on the ballot. Yeah. Where us, it's all outside. If you want to nominate someone, you write me a letter, send me an email, call mm-hmm. me, and, and then that's how the person gets on the ballot. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, Tom Cheek was well deserved. I mean, four thousand three hundred and six games in a row without missing yeah. a day. You know, none of us work that many days yeah. without missing a day uh, <laughs> of work. So uh, he did great, and surely he's the sweetest lady you'd ever met. His yeah. wife and and uh, the family I met for the first time and. And they are also great and nice to nice to meet. Mm-hmm. Now, what what do you think it means to be inducted? Like, so you get that designation of a Hall of Famer, and, and what do you think that signifies? Well, I look at a few of their inductees. I mean, back in two thousand one, we inducted Dave McKay. He's from Vancouver. He was in the first. He played third base for the first ever Blue Jay game back in seventy seven. And he turned around to give a speech because he was crying. It meant so much to him. He couldn't <laughs> face the crowd. So it was kind of a unique thing to, to see. Um, the Vancouver Asahi in 2003, they were, uh, they were a bunch of uh, Japanese Canadians that because of Pearl Harbor in the, during the war, they got uh, escorted out of where they were living and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and had to go to concentration camps and, and leave where they were. And, and, uh, but we inducted them in 2003, and they stood on the stage and sang, Oh, Canada. Oh, wow. You know, even though the Canadian government back in the 40s had basically taken their lives away from them right. because they were of Japanese descent. And, and uh, that's a long history lesson I won't go into. <laughs> Kids can learn all about Pearl Harbor and that stuff from their teachers. <laughs> but uh, we inducted the Vancouver Sahis, and they stood on the stage and sang, Oh, Canada. And that was just, that was just amazing. And, and uh, the other, other fellas, you know, you just look at George Bell when we told him, uh, this year, he said, "You know, Canada is my. I consider Canada and Toronto my my second home. Mm. You know, obviously he's from Dominican Republic, yeah. but he also played in Chicago with the Cubs and the White Sox, and obviously minor league ball in the states and whatnot. But he said, this is such an honor to me to be honored. You know, by my home, my second mm-hmm. home. You know, that I consider it, and you know, so it does mean a lot. I mean, we're it's not like we're the St. Mary's Baseball Hall of Fame. This yeah. is." Canada's Baseball Hall of Fame, you mm-hmm. know, Tom Hankey brought a busload of people up, yeah. you know, from his town of 600 people in it, and a bus of 50 people, so like 10% of the town yeah. came up for his, uh, and there was some big event in his town, or the rest of the town, he said, would have come up, <laughs> would have come up as well, but, uh, you know, these people are just, because it's Canada's Baseball Hall yeah. of Fame, it's not a small little Hall of Fame, you know, and uh, people see it means a lot, a lot mm. to them, and, and to be honored by a whole country, you know, right. when they, all they, a lot of them say, all they did was play baseball. You know, and the whole con- the country's honoring me. I'm like, right. well, yes, but you were, you know, you meant a lot to a lot of people, and, mm-hmm. and that's why you're in our Hall of Fame. Not to detract from it, but Bill Simmons has this idea that there should be tiers within a Hall of Fame, that it's unfair to a certain extent to have, and I won't use any examples here, but, like, Babe Ruth in the, in the Baseball Hall of Fame is a Hall of Famer. So is Burt Blylevin. And... The two of them, in terms of their impact and uh, overall, I guess, ability, is not even close. Like, So the, his idea is that there should be tiers of Hall of Fame. So you're like a top-level Hall of Famer, and then there's like your f- almost fringe Hall of Famer, guys who have debates. And like, I think the top level would be people who, 50 years after they play, people are still telling stories of, I saw him, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And then the bottom level would be guys who are great players, but ultimately, when you hear, oh, he's in the Hall of Fame, like oh, like I, what are your thoughts about that? And and or do you feel as though it's better just to have this collective of Hall of Famers and here are the greatest 
players, builders, media yeah. that we have. I think tiering would be hard because you'd still get the arguments of you know who's a, right. who's one A, who's one B, who's one C, you know, and mm-hmm. why are they second compared to the first guys? And yeah. I mean, you're always going to get the controversies of who's in the hall and who's not. You know, we get letters and phone calls every year saying, "Well, why isn't this guy in the Hall of Fame yet?" And right. and you know, we try to explain to them. And some people we make happy with their answer, <laughs> and some people we don't. But that's just part of it. In Cooperstown we get the same thing. I mean, they yeah. inducted no living inductees this year. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure a lot, they got a lot of phone calls about that, you yeah. know, saying, what do you think you're doing, you know, type thing. But, again, it's not Cooperstown does it. It's the Baseball Writers of America yeah. that do it, and then Cooperstown inducts them. But I, I, I think here, I mean, if you're a Hall of Famer, you're a Hall of Famer. You're a Hall of Famer for different reasons. Like, uh, for example, I mean, um, like I mentioned, Rob Ducey yeah. versus George Bell. You know, um, yeah. you have uh, Gladwin Scott, who ran provincial baseball in Manitoba for 50 years. You know, he's a Hall of Famer. Um, does anyone know who he is as opposed to Tim Raines or George Bell mm-hmm. or Tom Mankey? No. But if you look at his placard out in the hallway, you'll see, wow, you know, what he did for the mm-hmm. province of Manitoba for 50 years. Right. You know, definitely he should be in our Hall of Fame. Or there's all kinds of Dave Sherry for Saskatchewan, Ron Hader for Alberta, John Har for British Columbia, Bernie Soulier for Ontario here. Mm-hmm. You know, we have uh, Richard Bellec from Quebec. You know, we have all kinds, and our committee likes that. They, you know, the famous guys seem to get in, but also the less famous guys you've never heard of. Mm-hmm. But without them, you know, you wouldn't have had, without Gladwin Scott, maybe Corey Koski never played mm-hmm. a thousand games in the big leagues, right. right? And, you know, one day might be in our Hall of Fame as well. And, uh, so I think it's definitely, it would be hard to tier them. And, uh, and to rank them. I mean, you can rank them, you know, players, administrators, that way, that's mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. Um, but I think if you're a Hall of Famer, you're a Hall of Famer. I mean, no, not everyone's Fergie Jenkins who's in our Hall of Fame. There's only one Fergie Jenkins in this mm-hmm. world, and and there might be never be another Canadian Fergie Jenkins that plays this game. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's by far wins. He holds every Canadian yeah. pitching record, and uh, you know, so yeah, there's not there's not five Fergie Jenkins in our Hall of Fames, but you know. There aren't any other Fergie Jenkins in Canada, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, and let alone the world. I mean, he's in Cooperstown. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, so he's one of those rare, rare classes that he's in Cooperstown as yeah. well. So, do you get? Do you think that the designation of having a Canadian Baseball Hall of Famer might help someone like Tim Raines? And there's a campaign to get Tim Raines into the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Do you think that by inducting him here, that might? help his cause somehow i think a little bit i mean again because they look at his accomplishments and what other people have thought of him i yeah. mean we inducted gary carter in 2001 and then yeah. he got into cooperstown a couple of years later andre right. dawson was 2004 and he got i think 2010 in cooperstown um so we hope tim Raines follows the same suit yeah. within a couple of years he's at 52 percent, so he'll still be a few years yeah. away i i believe but uh he'll definitely get there and, and like like we do we look at other people's accomplishments you know are you you know what? What do you do on the field? What do you do off the field? Have you been honored by other people? You know, your mm-hmm. hometown maybe put you in their Hall of Fame. Right. The province you live in or the state you lived in maybe put you in their Hall of Fame. Right. Or George Bell, his country, the, the Blue Jays level of excellence. Well, you know, everyone on the Blue Jay level of excellence is in our Hall of Fame now, except Delgado, who they added this yes. year, um, who will probably be in ours one day, obviously as well. Delgado is one of the greatest Blue Jays, but you know, we found it. Uh, important that you know george bell's been honored by the blue jays and he hasn't been honored by us so our committee considered that greatly mm-hmm. and uh and so i think i think anything that you can put on your resume will will definitely help you know mm-hmm. get into the next you know the next level the next place you're looking to go are you looking at let's say for non-canadians because obviously there are a lot of non-canadians mm-hmm. who have made significant contributions to canadian baseball who are in the canadian baseball hall of fame but there are some who i looked at the list and i was sort of curious as to why they'd be in the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. And the one that jumped out to me was Tommy Lasorda, mm-hmm. legendary manager for the Dodgers. And I believe, I'm convinced he's in Cooperstown yep, for is. being the manager of the Dodgers. He wasn't much of a player. No. But he played nine seasons in Montreal. And so he's in the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. So is he in the... Now, I, this is an unfair question, so... Um, <laughs> no, let, go let, ahead. Let me, re- yeah. let me reword it then. <laughs> like, So do you think he was inducted... Because he's Tommy Lasorda, and people took into his account his managerial career, or because he was in Montreal for nine years. I think people looked at Tommy Lasorda as one of the greatest minor league players ever to play in Canada. Because we always, again, we try to do the the famous people, the administrator people, professional baseball, amateur baseball, minor league baseball. Right. And uh, Tommy Lasorda hold, played nine years in Montreal, which is a record. He has the most wins most innings pitched, most strikeouts, and mm-hmm. I believe the second most career starts 
in the history of the Montreal Royals, and the Royals are around, I'm just guessing, but about 80 years, right. you know. And so they have a huge, long history, and Tom the sort of holds four of the biggest pitching records you can hold in, in mm-hmm. Montreal history. Right. So I think the committee looked at that. I mean, yeah, they all knew who he was and how famous Dodger Blue he is. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he looked at Montreal was the farm team for, for Brook, it was Brooklyn back then. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he had a great long career in Montreal, and he won, you know, all the records he holds and the numbers he put up, and so they definitely, you but know, that's that's why he was inducted. So in general, though, it's it's the contribution to Canada or their 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 time in Canada as opposed to overall career and happened to play in Canada too. So like think, a, like uh, take take Roger Clemens, yeah. right? Roger Clemens, one of the greatest pitchers ever, two seasons with the Blue Jays, mm-hmm. and you know perhaps those two seasons may be Hall of Fame worthy because he won the Cy Young both years, but. So in that case, you're looking at those two years as opposed to entire career. Like, like I'm, I'm just curious about what the distinctions would be then uh, in, in making these determinations of who who's eligible, for lack of a better word, for the Canadian baseball. Yeah, player. and I, I think with guys like that, I mean, 75% of our inductees are Canadian. Yeah. The other quarter are the sort of the, I'll say the Blue Jacks, Bull Greats, yeah. plus a few others. Um, guys like Roger Clevens, I mean, you have to sort of longevity as well. Yeah. I mean, two years... Um, Robbie Alomar played five and a half years, but again, he did everything with the Blue Jays. Yeah, I don't think our committee would look at someone who played just two years and say, you know, he did a lot for baseball in Can. I mean, Roger did with Cy Young twice, and you obviously can't get any better than that right. winning the Cy Young Award. Roger's done all kinds of other things since that <laughs> some people don't agree with, or, yeah. but uh, and that's another topic, of course. <laughs> but I think our committee more looks at longevity. Well, I mean, Tommy Lasorda had his nine years. Joe Carter played for seven years with the Blue Jays. Alomar played for, I think, f- I'll say five or six. So not only what you've done, but also some longevity. I mean, right. people think Paul Mulder and Dave Winfield should be in here, but again, there's a year each. You know, right? they only played a year or two each, yeah. and you know they won the World Series. Are they amazing players? Yes, obviously they're both in Cooperstown. Yeah. So they some of the best players ever wear a Jays uniform, but longevity wasn't necessarily there, right. and uh, and the committee looks at that aspect mm-hmm. as well. And do you struggle with the same questions that I guess the baseball writers more than the people in Cooperstown struggle with? And in, in the last 20 years of PEDs and trying to balance those issues and, and you know is, is there a different set of circumstances that I mean Carlos Delgado is a guy who you mentioned who the Blue Jays honored this summer and I think there are rumblings about what he did when he was a player uh, and if he was or if he wasn't mm-hmm. and, and is that do you, do you wrestle with those sorts of questions too? We do a little bit as a committee and as a Hall of Fame. I mean, when the Mitchell Report came out several years ago, there was uh, two Canadians on it. Cody McKay, Uh who's from Vancouver, and Eric Gagne from Quebec. Cody McKay had a good minor league career. We only played a couple games in the big leagues with Oakland and St. Louis. But uh, Eric Gagne is uh, on our ballot now because he's retired. He had to be retired three years, and he has, and then someone nominated him um, for our Hall. The first year on the ballot, he didn't get talked about very much or very many votes. I think similar to Cooperstown, maybe our committee's not sure what to do with him. I mean, he's publicly admitted it. He didn't for a long time, yeah. but then he wrote a book last year, and he publicly admitted it in his book. So, I mean, that will help that he's not saying nothing or saying right. no yeah. now. He has come out and said, I did it, and I'm sorry, and I shouldn't have. And, you know, the, the pro athletes and their lines they give, you know. Yeah. You know, Ryan Braun finally said, yeah, I did it. I made a mistake, whereas last year he's saying no. And yeah. same with Raphael Palmero and Corey yeah. said yeah. no, and then he, a couple weeks later he tested positive. Yeah. And, and it's just professional athletes and, and what they say who who knows who's telling them what to say yeah. you know when to say it but uh you know our committee i mean eric gagne is our, our biggest one right now he's the only one that's been i'll say proven mm-hmm. um that maybe done something to have done something wrong right and uh it will affect his chance to get here i assume it will i mean you look at his numbers if he was clean he'd be a first ballot hall of famer Cy yeah. young award the 84 consecutive saves yeah you know he was just amazing for for that five six seven years yeah. and he's a canadian he played i think i think he got up to 10 years of big league ball plus some minor league ball yeah but right now with that hanging over his head right it would definitely be tough and and say you get nine years on the ballot he, he got a couple of votes his first year because i mean some people mm. like everything else some people just overlook that yeah. and say you know yeah. they don't care you know they, it's like a committee and yeah. someone's obviously on every committee is going to have their opinions and yeah. but i expect more talk about him in the next few yeah. years just to see where he belongs and whether he should be yeah. you know inducted here and and it will be it'll be controversial if he gets mm-hmm. in here i think it'll be a controversial year for the hall of fame which 
which will bring us in the newspapers and the media, yeah. which isn't all bad because right. then we promote the Hall of Fame more. Yeah. But uh, we'll we'll see when that comes, what happens. Yeah. And, and that's a situation too where you wonder how good he might have been if he hadn't done it. Yeah. Um, because he flamed out as a starter, and then they, he was a closer, and he was fantastic. But if he was on PEDs, maybe it's different. But at the same time, all the hitters were on PEDs, or a lot of the hitters were too. So, I mean, how do you take that and do it again? It's true. It's a tricky. And it is. And I think, like, Cooperstown, they're not sure. Or yeah. so I shouldn't say Cooperstown. Again, the, the, the baseball writers, writers yeah. in America aren't sure what to do. Yeah. And then know, there's the whole thing of, like, I write for the most part. If I get carpal tunnel, I can take something and I'm better. Mm-hmm. Yet, if a baseball player takes something to improve, they're the worst person in the world. Like. Yeah. Like it's a whole. It's a really more complicated issue than just this guy cheated. I think. Yeah, there's just so many rules and regulations, and and you know, I I just think that, you know, you're playing Major League Baseball. They they, there's rules out there. Um, yeah. There's always going to be cheaters that try to get around the system yeah. in, in every aspect of life. Yeah. There are, but I mean, if if I'm in pro baseball, and I got, you know, the doctors around me and the trainers and whatnot, mm-hmm. I'm personally going to make sure. Before I yeah. eat something, drink something, yeah, yeah. do whatever that that it's okay to do, yeah. you know, because yeah. it's so rare to play major league baseball. Careers are short. You yeah. get injured and you're you're done. Someone jumps ahead of you and plays in your spot. Right. And and if I was in that position, I would just I would just yeah. be so careful. And right. and you got to trust. I mean, you're trusting your trainers and doctors. Yeah. If they give you wrong advice, you can still get you know messed up in the end and, and mm-hmm. unfortunate. But yeah. If you're listening to the experts who your team trusts, then that's that's all you can really go go yeah. on. So, yeah. and then but then Ryan Braun makes two hundred million dollars, and yes, he loses some this year. And but really, what's the downside for him? But so I, it's it, I really think it's an interesting issue. And plus, like all the guys in the sixties and seventies were using amphetamines, which you can't use now. Yeah. And it's, like the whole issue is is I think it's a lot more complicated, like you say, than it's just like there's different levels to it. And you got to take it. There is. It's just every every decade has something, and, yeah. and it's just what you believe in and what will go away or not yeah. go away. You yeah. know, a decade later, and mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's it's pro sports. Yeah, right? it's money. It's a business. Yeah. It's the difference between making fifty grand in AAA mm-hmm. or the major league minimums four hundred and fifty thousand. I think. Yeah. You know, so you can make fifty grand AAA. Or maybe you do this, yeah. and you'll all of a sudden make the major league minimum, which is ten times you're making, and maybe get a million dollar or ten million dollar contract. Yeah. You know, it's unfortunate that money talks, but yeah. with some players, it, it does, and yeah. it, money's yeah. always going to talk. Yeah. The Hall of Fame is responsible for the Tib O'Neill Award as well, which is awarded annually to the best Canadian player, and it started in 1984, and not surprisingly, Larry Walker has won the most. Uh, yeah. Tip O'Neill Awards with nine. Joey Votto's won three. And um, although it hasn't been awarded yet this year, I, I, I'd be, I be—I think I'm safe to say that he'll win this year. Uh, I, would, I would assume. Yeah. The only guy that's real close to him is uh, Jim Henderson in Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. He's got 22 saves. His ERA's right at two. Yeah. You know, he's got more strikeouts than he's pitched. But he'd have to go on a tear, and Joey would have to go on a big slide yeah. for, for things to switch yeah. up. So we're li- he'll... Likely to get his fourth this year. Jason Bays won it three times. Justin Morneau has won it twice. And a bunch of uh, one-time winners. Now, because Larry Walker has won it nine times, yet Ferguson Jenkins was pitching before the award was inaugurated. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I think that the debate over the best Canadian player of all time would be between those two. Now, it's tough to compare pitcher to, to hitter. Mm-hmm. But my guess would go to Walker, or my vote would go to Walker, maybe just because I grew up watching him. And he was my favorite player, and he's a left-handed hitter. And when I was growing up, I hit left-handed yeah, too. Yeah. And so I just loved watching him play. So he would get my vote. Who, who would get your vote as the greatest Canadian player? Oh, could I? Can I do greatest Canadian player and pitcher? No, <laughs> that would make it the, easy. That's basically the debate, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Because yeah. um, well, you got to figure like by the at the end of it, if Joey Votto keeps going the way he's going, he'll be in the discussion. You gotta think that. I mean, that was the same with Justin Morneau and Jason Bay, you know, yeah. five years ago, and you know they were both going to pass Larry Walker in yeah. everything. Then Jason Bay got they, well; they both had concussion troubles, mm-hmm. but Morneau's lasted longer in Bay's. Bay's had a few bad years in a row. He got released finally this year. Neither player has been the same since they got injured. But yeah. five years ago, they were going to both pass Larry Walker in in all the stats. Now everyone's saying that about Joey Votto. Yeah. Joey's had uh, a bit of injury history, but he, he's pretty good. His knee last year. And uh, but he he's good. In his he's going to win the on base title for the fourth year in a row. Right, you know yeah. he's just a walking machine. I think yeah. 
uh, he's going to set the Canadian walks record, I think, in the next uh, in September. Uh, and uh, so that's going to be it's his record. He's going to break, <laughs> but uh, you know he's going to break it again, yeah. which he has the last couple of years. Let me go back to a little bit on that. It, it's called the Tip O'Neill Award because James Tip O'Neill was the greatest hitter back in the late 1800s. Mm-hmm. I mean, he has a career 326 average. If you compare that to Larry Walker, it's, it's 313. Right. So even though the game is drastically different over the 100 years, Tip O'Neill was, if you just take stats, Tip O'Neill was a better hitter than mm-hmm. Larry Walker. But it's hard to do that because you're comparing 100 years difference and we all yeah. know how much the game's changed yeah. in 100 years. Yeah. I'm just dancing around this yeah. best yeah, player yeah, yeah, question yeah. for you. <laughs> but uh, I might have to lean more towards Fergie. Yeah. Um, for 284 wins. On a bad baseball team, he played right. with the Cubs most of the times. So he never yeah. made the playoffs. He did some time with Texas and Boston and mm-hmm. Philly, but you know he played most of his career with the Cubs on a bad team. And, yeah. and you just think he played, like you said, nineteen years, just one more year, win a year, and he had three hundred wins. You know, yeah. and he's not talked about as being the greatest because he didn't get three hundred wins. Yeah. You know, but one more win or a couple seasons on an actually a good team, and he would have had three hundred wins. Mm-hmm. He has over three thousand strikeouts. There's only about. I'll say 15 and 20 pitchers with over 3,000 strikeouts. Mm-hmm. But more unique is he's one of only, I believe, four pitchers to have over 3,000 strikeouts and less than 1,000 walks. Wow. So that's Pedro Martinez and Greg Maddox and, uh, and Kurt Schilling, I think, are the other three. Um, so that shows his control and his command mm-hmm. to have that few walks and yeah. that many strikeouts. And his Cy Young, he, he won the 1971 Cy Young. He was an all-star three or four times, won 20 games six years in a row. Um and he's in Cooperstown. Yeah. I mean, in a few years, maybe Larry will get in Cooperstown too. And uh, and I don't doubt Larry's uh, numbers. I mean, he won the MVP in uh, 97. He hit 313 for his career. He hit three um, over 350 three years in a row. Yeah. You know, he won uh, eight or nine gold gloves and five or six all-stars, and he's a silver slugger three times and mm-hmm. and uh, our award nine times. Yeah. But just for the fact that Larry or that Fergie's in Cooperstown now, that he won all those games on a bad team, yeah. um, he was never hurt. You know, one of the downfalls with Larry is he got hurt, yeah. but he got hurt because he played hard. Yeah. You know, he was one of the best all-round players. He stole over 200 bases mm-hmm. as a big leaguer and hit almost 400 home runs. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's an all-round player. Yeah. You know, he had a rifle of an arm from right field, yeah. um, but because he played so hard, he got hurt a lot, mm-hmm. and uh, and his career ended. Because of injury, whereas Fergie's ended because you know he was, yeah. I'll say old. <laughs> you know he's done playing. Yeah. He played 19 yeah. years and, yeah. and he threw almost and, 300 uh, complete games. Yeah, like, yeah. Back then he had all yeah. the innings pitched and, yeah. and whatnot. So that's a very tough question. Yeah. And uh, but right now I'd have to pick Fergie over Larry. But like the tiered system, I'd put Larry one B. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that that's my thought as a, of today. I think Larry's got a battle to get into Cooperstown yeah. because of the. He, he because of the steroid era, he was 100 percent clean. We know that for a fact. Mm-hmm. But uh, he uh, he's battling those guys. He's battling his injuries. Yeah. And uh, and also he played in Montreal and Colorado, which I think are bad excuses. But the media says playing up here in Canada, you don't get noticed as much, and playing yeah. in Colorado with the thin air, yeah, you know, helped him. But I don't believe either of those. No. There's not his home runs didn't go one foot over the fence. You right. know, with yeah. a light Colorado air would have yeah. pulled it over the fence. You know, his, he had yeah. 383 home runs, yeah. and and everyone has their simple home run that just makes it over but mm-hmm. he had monster shots and yeah. he was an amazing player and an all-around player too mm-hmm. with 230 career steals yeah. i mean yeah. in the home and influential runs. too like he's a bc guy right yep. and and a lot of the players now come from bc yeah. uh so the, and there's a great infrastructure a great little league infrastructure most years the little league world series team from canada is from bc although this year it was from ottawa so there's that infrastructure there, and, and he could be influential in that, and kids growing up saying, here's a local guy making yep. good, and, and sort of in, in, impact there. But there's the Fergie Jenkins field down uh, um, in St. In, uh, Catharines area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sort of in tobacco country, or what yeah. used to be tobacco yeah. country, yeah. where he grew up. So, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it is. It's, Larry's know. doing a great thing with Baseball Canada now. He's... Uh, He's helping with their national team, oh, yeah. um, with their senior national team. He's coaching with them um, two or three times a year. He goes on the trips. Mm-hmm. He goes to all the big tournaments, the World Baseball Classic. and the, uh, He wasn't there in the Olympics because he was finishing his career out, but uh, the World Baseball Classic mm-hmm. he's been to um, and all the senior national championships um, he helps out, which is, which is great because, yeah. again, these guys are all starting their career, and yeah. Larry you know, is the greatest player, one of the yeah. greatest players, and, uh, and for them to look up to him. I mean, three of the four... September call-ups from British Columbia. 
you know. So, I mean, the BC is still leading the charges, even though we got some pretty good players from Ontario, yeah. with John Axford and Joey Votto. And, yeah. But uh, there's a lot of BC players, and their weather out there allows them to play a little bit longer, and their system out there is uh, very good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame here in St. Mary's, we're posting this October 9th, so it's open daily until Saturday. Correct. Uh-huh. So if you're in town, come on out. But the hours generally, if people want to come visit, uh, what's the best way for them to uh, to do that? Yeah, I mean, our, everything's on our website, which is just baseballhalloffame.ca, or uh, you can give us a call at 519-284-1838. We're basically open the baseball season. We open the beginning of May right through to the Canadian Thanksgiving, which I think this year is October 12th. In the wintertime, um, our office is open year-round, so basically you call us, email us, set up a time you can come by. And uh, we'll meet you here at the museum and open the doors and, and give you a tour. So, um, like I talked earlier, baseball in Canada is uh, we're not hockey. <laughs> so <laughs> baseball slows down a little bit in, yeah. in Canada in, in the cold January, Februarys, uh, unfortunately. So, but uh, if you want to come visit us in the winter time, call us, email us, you know, and uh, and we'll definitely be glad to set up something with you to come and uh, check out our facility. That's good. And like you say, it's it's. A v- relatively small space but it, there's a lot of stuff here and uh, we jam pack it i mean yeah. we talked a few years ago hanging stuff on the ceiling <laughs> but again we didn't want it falling on people's heads yeah. as they're walking around but uh yeah i mean we jam pack as much as we can into it yeah. because we want to show people our our collection and we still yeah. want to get a third of it on but mm-hmm. in the next uh we hope to dig uh, break ground next year for our new expansion ten thousand square foot yeah. museum on on site here and then be open late 2015 so yeah. watch for that and uh and then we'll use this current facility for more storage and archives. So yeah, that's it's it's a really terrific place. I would recommend anybody who's in town come on out. Or even if you're in Toronto, it's a couple hours out. It's yep. not far. Uh, no, uh, we're ninety minutes from the Toronto airport, yeah. or or you know two hours from the Rogers Center if you're down uh, in the by the Jays game. So yeah. we're not that far away. So that's uh, Scott Crawford, Director of Operations, Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, I'm glad you had me on. Thank that's you very nice. much. Anyone, if you have questions, comments for the podcast, historyslam at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.